Presented here are four views of calculus, a subject that all too often appears as overwhelming because of the large number of mathematical skills and methods that weave through the subject. The purpose of this video is to present insight into the principal ideas behind calculus, as opposed to a treatment of the usual basic skills and methods. Professor Raoul Bott will talk about that moment in the calculus where we come face to face with infinite processes. Professor Deborah Hughes Hallett will present an application of a system of differential equations while paying close attention to physically interpreting the results. Professor Joe Mazur will talk about just how far you can get in integration without using the limit process. Professor Frank Morgan will talk about maximizing and minimizing and the ordinary soap bubble's ability to maximize volume with a limited surface area. The suggested background for the material presented in these videos is an understanding of limits, differentiation, and integration. This would mean that the viewer has completed at least one semester of calculus. I've come to the conclusion that it's always good to try to guess the answer to a problem before you attempt the problem. There's some deep reasons for that, actually. One is you really don't usually understand a problem until you've started to try to guess what the answer to it might be. And often with, with students, if you ask them to guess, they then start asking very deep questions about what the problem means. So that's one good aspect. But the main reason that it adds some interest and training to the working of the problem. You're forced to exercise your intuition a little bit. Now, a lot of times, you have no idea what the answer could be. So, the answer will, so your guess will be a wild guess. That's fine. You just make the best guess you can. Sometimes you're surprised when you find out the answer, how accurate you were, and you're pleased. And you're more confident next time in guessing. Other times, you're completely astonished. And you aren't satisfied until you understand better why your guess was so bad. And when you've learned that lesson, you've developed your intuition. We human beings try to maximize profit or happiness. We try to minimize cost or time or pollution, perhaps. We spend our lives seeking maximums and minimums, or to use the official plurals, maxima and minima. Now, for many problems that occur, the maximum is actually, or minimum, occurs as an extreme case. For example, if you want to minimize the amount of money you spend today, just don't spend any money. If you want to minimize the amount of pollution in a certain area, just ban pollution in that area. On the other hand, for certain problems, the best solution is some intermediate critical balance between competing factors. So for example, how big should Sears make its new warehouse? Well, if it's too big, then it'll cost too much money to build and maintain. On the other hand, if it's too small, the store will be running out of things and it'll be bad for business. So the ideal solution in this case is some intermediate critical balance. Well, I'd like to start out today by thinking about a puzzle. So here's the puzzle. When is x minus 2x cubed biggest for what value of x between the given extreme cases of 0 and 1? So this is something you can just think about. So remember, we're just going to take some value of x and try to make that expression x minus 2x cubed big. So for example, does anybody want to take a guess? Let's try some values of x. Anybody have any ideas? We'll, we'll try some values of x and see how big y equals x minus 2x cubed gets. A third. OK, there's an idea. A third. Put in a third. Let's see, what do we get for y? We'll get a third minus 2 27ths, about 0.259. So maybe that looks pretty. That looks like a possibility. I mean, it's better, for example, than what you get when x is 0, when y is only 0. And I think it's better than what you get 
at the other extreme, too. When x is 1, then y is 1 minus 2 or minus 1. Anybody else want to take a guess? A half. Okay, there's a good idea. Let's see, a half. Maybe that one I can even do in my head. A half minus 2 eighths is a half minus a quarter is a quarter. So, oh, good try, Meg, but not quite as good as Jordan's. Anybody else want to take a try on this? You know, you could a fourth. So a fourth is down here on the other side of a third. So let's see, if we took a quarter minus 2 64ths, that would be a quarter minus a 32nd, which would be 3 32nds. And what's that? 0 0.094. Well, that looks pretty bad. I guess we could graph these and try to get some idea of what's happening here. Graph, here's the x-axis, here's the y-axis. We're just interested in this area from where the ones are involved, maybe going down to minus one. We told that it's zero, it was zero. And at one, it was minus one. And at a half, it was about a quarter. And that at a third, it was a little more than a quarter. So I don't know what it's doing exactly. And we could keep guessing for a long time, of course, and maybe we'd find better and better spots. And the question is, how can you locate the spot, how can you locate the precise spot where it hits its peak? How can you find the exact spot where it hits its peak? And there's something special about that spot which helps you find it. And the thing about that spot is, at the very peak, it's flat and the derivative is zero. So the way to find the exact spot, we don't know what this is yet exactly, question mark, the way to find that exact spot is that it's the place where the derivative is zero. So the maximum here, in this particular problem at least, is where the derivative is zero. Now we know how to compute the derivative of this function. It's derivative of x is 1, derivative of 2x is minus 6x squared. And if that's 0, that means that x squared is a 6, which means that x is equal to 1 over the square root of 6, only one you wouldn't guess. That's about 0 0.408. And that means that y, if we plug that in, y is equal to 1 over the square root of 6 minus 2 times 1 over that cubed, which is 6 square roots of 6. Or that's something times 1 over the square root of 6. Let's see, 1 minus 2 sixths, or a third of that, I guess. Two thirds of that, so that would be 2 over 3 square root of 6, which is about 0.272, something like that. So it's, it's somewhere in here, somewhere in here. It's possible to get up to 0.272. That when you're at this particular value, 1 over square root 6. And by using calculus, we've actually found it exactly. That place in the middle where we reach the maximum, we identified by finding it as the place where the derivative is 0. So that, that's, that's the great idea here. And in fact, the kinds of things we've been thinking about lead to a general method for finding maxima and minima. The two kinds of cases we've talked about are the only ones you have to worry about. Extreme cases, which sometimes you're given. For example, in this problem, we were told that x was between 0 and 1. Or sometimes you have to reason them out. Or sometimes there's no limit on x, and you've got to think about what happens as x goes, gets bigger and bigger and approaches infinity. And second, those critical balance points, which are identified by the derivative being 0. And of course, you'd know, I think, if even if I didn't say so, it would be to alert to problems about the function or the derivative being undefined. So this, this is our method. Now we have this methodical method. It ought to work for this problem or any problem. And just for practice, let's solve this first problem methodically. Right now I'm going to do a methodical solution to the, to the puzzle. So here comes a methodical methodical solution to the puzzle. Remember what we want to do here. Remember what the puzzle was. 
was to maximize y equals x minus 2x cubed for x between 0 and 1. And according to our method, first of all, we're supposed to look at the extreme cases. First extreme is on the left when x is 0. y is plugging in, we get 0. Second extreme case is on the right-hand endpoint. When x is 1, y was minus 1. So those are the two extreme cases. And then we also look at the critical cases, where we set 0 equal to y prime, which in this case was 1 minus 6x squared. And that gave us that x was equal to 1 over the square root of 6, and y was equal to 2 over 3 square root of 6, which remember was about 0.272. And so those were the three things we looked at, y0, y minus 1, and y about 272. And now you just compare those. And you see right away that 272 is indeed the biggest one, the maximum. And y equals minus 1 at the end point is the minimum. And now for some language here, we call that value of y the maximum value. So in this case, we call, we call that maximum value of y, in this case, was 2 over 3 square root of 6, the maximum value. And if we're also interested in the x, we call the corresponding x, which is 1 over the square root of 6 here, the maximum point. So there we've seen that this method works in that puzzle example. Let's try another example. Let's try another example. So here we'll look at now example 2. So this time we want to find the maxima and minima of, and here comes another function, y equals x to the 2 thirds. So you remember what these fractional exponents mean, right? That means the cube root of x squared. And we're given that x is bigger than or equal to minus 1. Now whenever I see a radical, I worry about whether it's defined or not until I remember that cube roots are always defined. Because the cube root of a positive number is a positive number. The cube root of a negative number, that's fine. That's a negative number. So that's no problem. Actually, here it wouldn't matter anyway, I guess, would it? Because the radicand x squared is always non-negative anyway. So no worry there. We want to find the maximum and minimum of this, and we'll just use our method. So we start out. We look at the extreme cases. Extreme cases. So first of all, we're given the lowest possible value of x, minus 1. And when x is minus 1, what is y? y is the cube root of minus 1 squared, or the cube root of 1, or 1 is the value of y. And now, we aren't given any upper limit on x. It can get as big as you like. And we have to worry about what happens as it gets bigger and approaches infinity. So as x approaches plus infinity, well, what happens? Well, the bigger x is, the bigger x squared is, the bigger this cube root of x squared is. y just keeps getting bigger and bigger, too. So y approaches plus infinity. y just keeps getting bigger and bigger. And when that happens, I would say it can't have any maximum at all. Because no matter how big it gets, it gets bigger than that later. Or maybe you would like to say the maximum value is infinity at infinity. I guess you could say that. But since infinity isn't a real number, let's agree not to say that and to say that it really has no maximum. There's no number where it actually reaches its maximum. And I know that already, even though I haven't looked at the critical cases yet. Even though I haven't looked at the critical cases yet. And now I should look at the critical cases. So I'll set 0 equal to the derivative. 0 equal to y prime. The derivative of x to a power is that power, 2 thirds, times x to the 1 lower power. 2 thirds minus 1 is minus a third. And that means 2 thirds times 1 over the cube root of x. 
Now, I noticed two things about that. First of all, it's never 0. So, so this happens nowhere. But I'm alert, and I notice something else. When I have something in the denominator of a fraction that might be 0, there's a place where the derivative might be undefined. So I have to worry about that. So this is undefined when x is 0. And when x is 0, going back to the original function, y is 0, too. And so I have to worry about that value of y. The other value of y I looked at before was 1. The smaller of these two must be the minimum. So this y equals 0 must be the minimum value. Now, we did all this just by following our method. I don't even know what a graph of the function looks like, maybe. But I was still able to find the maximum value, in this case, never attained, never reaches it, just keeps getting bigger, and the minimum value of 0. Actually, in case you're curious, I could put a little picture of the graph down here, maybe. Starting at minus 1. This function happens to look like this, sort of like a bird. It's getting bigger here. It has a little cusp or spike at the origin. And that's the place that we found where the derivative was undefined, but which was the minimum. The picture actually looks like that. Now, I thought I'd show you here a uh, sketch I've been working on of the sorts of various things that can happen when you're looking for maximum and minimum. Again, they're going to be pointing out our main theme that you have to worry about the critical cases and the extreme cases. So at the top here, for example, is a function which attains its maximum at a place where the derivative is 0, where the graph goes flat. And that's one kind of thing that can happen. In the lower right, is a very simple function, the function y equals x for x between 0 and 1, which obviously attains its maximum and minimum at the extreme points. Its minimum at the left endpoint and its maximum at the right endpoint. The lower left is a tougher extreme case example. Here there's a fraction, x squared over 1 plus x squared. Now this, I guess, is a nice fraction because the denominator, at least, is never 0. Right? x squared is always non-negative. 1 plus x squared is always positive. And the whole fraction, therefore, is non-negative. But what happens as x gets larger and larger? Well, let's think about that. When x, squared is, when x squared is 1, for example, you get 1 half. When x squared is 10, you get 10 elevenths. When x squared is 100, you get 100 over 101. When x squared is a billion, you get a billion over a billion in 1. You keep getting fractions that are closer and closer to 1 without ever reaching 1. So this is a different kind of example where there is no max. Not because the function keeps getting bigger and bigger, but because the function keeps getting closer and closer to 1 without ever reaching 1. Find it as an extreme case. The examples in the middle here are examples where the function or the derivative are undefined. So in this first one here, I've graphed f of x is 1 over x, which you know, let's just look at x positive now. As x gets very large, the denominator gets large, the fraction gets small. But as x gets close to 0, where the function is undefined, the fraction gets very large. And it never, therefore, attains a maximum. It just keeps getting bigger and bigger. No matter where you are, you can always get bigger by getting closer to 0, the place where the function is undefined. The second example, y equals minus absolute value of x. You see the familiar v graph of absolute value of x turned upside down so that the maximum occurs at the origin where the derivative is undefined. I mean, from the left, it looks like the derivative is going to be plus 1. On the right side, it looks like the derivative is going to be minus 1. So at the origin, there's no well-defined derivative. And these are the types of things that can occur in looking for maximum and minimum. Always having to do with the extreme case, 
and critical value. Some of the problems that you're going to see later on, you might even get as homework maybe from your teacher, may be a lot more complicated with the algebra, or computing the derivatives might be a little more complicated to do, but it will be these same principles at work in every case. Now another thing you sometimes see in a calculus book is a theorem, something like this. So you open a book and you see a theorem, and it says something like this. A continuous function f on a closed interval a, b, and that means the set of all x's between a and b inclusive, so as opposed to the closed interval. Sometimes I like to think that the doors or the points at the end are there, not missing, attains a maximum and a minimum. Now I must say, when I first read things like this in books, I was not very impressed. I thought, well, sure, a function probably going to have a maximum or a minimum somewhere. And why are these people so fussy about all this nonsense about continuous function, closed interval? That can't be very important. That's what I thought when I first read things like that. But you know, as a matter of fact, this theorem is false. On an open interval, that is, if you don't include the endpoints, let me show you an example of that. So this theorem would be false on the open interval from 0 to 1. So this theorem fails on what's called the open interval when the doors are missing. Interval, even the one from 0 to 1. So that's the set of all x's between 0 and 1 exclusive. We aren't allowing the endpoints now. For even the function f of x equals x. Let me graph the function f of x equals x. We know what that looks like. But now the endpoints are missing. Now the endpoints are missing. And so it never gets to the maximum value of 1. That point 1 is not allowed in our, in, in our values for our values of x. And so the function never reaches the maximum value of 1. In this case, there is no max. No maximum at all. You might say, well, doesn't it reach its maximum at the point just before 1? But of course, there is no last point just before 1. No matter how close to 1 you get, there's always some other point halfway in between where it gets still bigger. So there's no maximum. It never reaches a maximum. Or here's another example where the function that we looked at a minute ago, f of x equals 1 over x. Graph that. Remember what the graph looked like. It looks something like this. And here's a case where, yes, I guess it would be undefined at 0, but we aren't even allowed to look at 0 on the open interval. So this looks like a very nice function. Actually, it's a continuous function defined everywhere in the open interval. And yet it keeps getting bigger and bigger as you go to the left-hand endpoint. And therefore, it never reaches a maximum. There's another example where there's no maximum. So that theorem isn't always, doesn't generalize to all cases. It's also not true if the function isn't continuous. So this theorem fails, even if the only problem is that the function isn't continuous. So theorem fails if f not necessarily continuous. Of course, you might have a function something like this. It looks like it's going to get hit a maximum here. But just where you expect it to hit the maximum, it jumps down discontinuously and does something else for a while. So at this place where it was supposed to be at its maximum, it's down here instead. It's discontinuity let it evade having a maximum at all. So there's another example where there's no maximum. So you know, this theorem is much more fragile and much less helpful than you might think when you look at it at first. It's only true under very special hypotheses. 
But the, maybe we can excuse that, you know, because it turns out that mathematics is actually very big and very complicated. And we understand very little about it. So when we can understand one little thing that even is right in a few special cases, we write it down and call it a theorem and think, well, it's nice we know something. But the truth of the matter is that we don't know very much about mathematics at all. And most of the time, we just don't know what to expect. And you get problems, as I've shown you already, for which there is no optimal solution, for which there is no maximum and no minimum. And as a matter of fact, problems like that occur in the real world, too. Here's one I like to think about. What would be the lightest airplane wing you could design to carry an airplane? Well, one way that engineers have of making structures light involves putting lots of tiny holes inside the structure. So it's still just as big and still has the same structural integrity. It has a lot of little cavities and holes in it. And it turns out that the more and more, that the tinier and more numerous you make the holes, the lighter you can make the airplane wing. But there's no ideal solution. Because if you kept just putting in more and more holes, you'd have nothing but holes at the end. You wouldn't have any wing at all. And so there's a practical problem that has no optimal solution. This really occurs. And so what I want to talk about now as we move into the second portion of this talk is real world maximum minima problem. And here the theme is going to be exactly the same. That maximum and minima occur in extreme cases and that they also occur in these critical cases where you have a balance of competing factors. And I thought I would like to start out with the gardening problem. So you, it turns out you have an opportunity to work in your neighbor's garden for up to four hours this Saturday at $6 per hour. How long should you work to earn the most money? Well, you know the answer to this, right? You just work the whole four hours. The answer is obviously an extreme case. Obviously an extreme case. And lots of problems in the world are like that. They're just extreme cases. On the other hand, Suppose now you go home yourself to work in your yard, and you want to build a rectangular pen as large as possible with the 36 feet of fencing that you have for your new pet. The question is, what shape should you make that pen? Now, maybe you can guess that. Guess what shape that pen would be? Yeah, Ryan? Is it a square? A square happens to be exactly right, exactly right. And you notice that is not an extreme case at all. You aren't making it as long as possible in one direction or as long as possible in the other direction. In fact, it's exactly that intermediate case where the length equals the width, some critical balance. So this is, a, this is an example where the solution is a critical case. And those are the two kinds of cases that you have to worry about in general. And so here is the general method. Now, of course, when you're solving these real world problems, you have to translate it into math a little to get going first. You have to be very clear about the quantity y you're trying to minimize, let's say, and the variable x that you're allowed to adjust to perform that minimization. And then you have to put everything in terms of x, everything in terms of x, including you have to get y in terms of x as a function of x. And once you've done that, then you have it in the setting we already understand. We just check the extreme and the critical cases. Always alert for when the function or its derivative might not be defined. Always alert for that. So now we'll check out this method by doing methodical solution to the gardening problem. Methodical solution to the gardening problem. Methodical solution to the gardening problem. So I'll remind you what that problem was. Remember, our neighbor was talking to us, and he offered to pay us $6 an hour to work in the garden. And of course, the quantity that we want to minimize, or in this case, maximize, want to maximize our earnings. 
So that's the y in this case, our earnings y, y dollars. And what can we adjust? We can adjust the time that we work, or adjust the time that we spend, which will be x hours. And our neighbor told us that that was up to 4 hours, so x is between 0 and 4. And now, second of all, we need a formula for y in terms of x. So what's the, how do we figure out our total earnings? Well, that's easy. Our total earnings are just the rate at which we're being paid, which is $6 an hour, times the x hours, which gives us 6x dollars. So there's the formula for y as a function of x. And now we're ready to go on into step three and just follow our program of checking the extreme and the critical cases. That's what we're going to do next. We're going to start with the extreme cases, which are given to us in this case. x is between 0 and 4. So when we look at the extreme cases, we notice that when x is 0, y is 0. No hours, no money. When x is 4, y is 6 times 4, or $24. Pretty good. Now what about the critical cases? Somehow we don't think they should matter here. Let's see what happens when we said 0 equal to y prime. Well, our function is 6x. We take the derivative of that, we get 6, and that's never 0. So there are no critical cases. That's very satisfying. And indeed, the extreme cases give us the minimum and the maximum. The maximum earnings being $24 by working all four hours, and the minimum being working zero hours and earning nothing at all. So good, our method seems to work when the answer is extreme cases. Now let's do a methodical solution. Now let's do a methodical solution to the rectangular pen problem. The rectangular pen problem. Remember, we had 36 feet of fencing. That's what we were given. 36 feet of fencing. And in this problem, what we want to maximize is the area. So we want to maximize the area, which I'll call A. So that's our Y in this case. But I'll use the letter A instead of the letter Y, because it's easy to remember then that that's talking about area. And what can we adjust? Well, there's some choices here, but for example, we could adjust the length of the pen. Could also use the width, but let's use the length. We, we'll adjust the length of the pen, which I'll call x. So let me draw the pen over here. So here we have our pen. Remember, it has 36 feet of fencing. And the length is x, so the bottom and the top both use x feet of fencing. And now in the second step, we're going to have to figure out everything in terms of x. So for example, we'll have to know the length of the sides in terms of x, which is just the amount of fence left. So if 2x feet of fence is used in the top and the bottom, that leaves 36 minus 2x for the sides, and each side gets half of that. Or I guess I can simplify that as 18 minus x feet on the side. So figured out the sides. Of course, what we really need to know is the area. But the area is just the length times the width. So now the area equals the length times the width. So that's just equal to x times 18 minus x, which is 18x minus x squared. So that finishes step two in our procedure. We have a formula for A or Y in terms of X. Step three, we're going to start out by looking at the extreme cases. Now for this pen, the extreme cases are actually quite silly. We don't have to think about them very long. To make X as big as possible, to use all the fence to go in the horizontal direction, would be a really stupid small pen. Similarly, to make 
the pen as long in the other direction as possible would be the same stupid pen going up and down instead of back and forth. These cannot be the answer. Therefore, the answer must be the max must be a critical point. So the max in this case must be a critical point. So we get it by setting 0 equal to the derivative, 0 equal to a prime. Now I want to take the derivative of this function. Derivative of 18x is 18. Derivative of x squared is 2x. So I have 18 minus 2x. And for that to be 0, that means that x is equal to 9. So for our answer in the pen here, x is equal to 9. Top is 9. And the side is 18 minus x, also 9. Left side is 9. The area is 81. The area is 81. And there is our square as the optimal solution, just as you predicted, which means that both us and our method are in good shape. Yeah, Jordan. Uh, thank you. Uh, I'm a bit confused. Earlier, I, I can understand how by taking the first derivative and then setting it to zero, we can find the critical points. But you also said that that point was going to be the balance of competing forces, and I don't, I don't see why that's true. So how in this case, how can we think, how can we give this problem the physical interpretation of competing effects at work? Well, I guess the two competing uh, factors are that for the area to be big, you'd, you'd like the horizontal sides to be long. But that would make the vertical sides short. On the other hand, you'd like the vertical sides to be long, but that would make the horizontal sides short. And it's the balance when they're exactly equal between these two competing desires that gives the optimal solution. See if you can guess. Oh, you can probably guess the answer to this problem, too. We've sold our pet. I'm sorry. We sold our pet. But we have two new pets. We have two new pets, smaller pets. And now we want to find the biggest adjacent pair of identical rectangular pens we can make with the same 36 feet of fencing to put our new two pets in. Uh, we're advised not to put them in the same pen uh, if we want to have just two pets for long. So there's our next problem. And you can, maybe you can guess the answer to this, too. Susie. I bet it's two squares. Two squares. So that sounds like, sounds like a good guess. So let's put that up here. One square was good. Two squares ought to be better. So here's Susie's guess. Susie's guess is two squares. Draw two squares here. Susie's guess is two squares. Let's see, how big would they be? Well, remember, we have 36 feet of fencing. Now, this should be evenly divided among all the walls. How many are there? One, two, three, four, five, six, seven. So I guess the top would be 36 over 7. The middle would be 36 over 7. And the side here would be 36 over 7, and so on. And let's see what the area would be then. The area would be twice the area of each pen, and each pen would be 36 over 7 squared. And how, well, how big is that, approximately? Let's see. 36 divided by 7 squared times 2, 52.9. 52.9. Now, of course, that's not as big as the 81 square feet we had before, but we couldn't expect it to be because we have to add a wall to separate the two pens. Okay, so there's a good guess. It's always good to guess at a problem before you do it. If you're right, you're proud. If you're wrong, you're intrigued. So let's do a methodical solution now. Let's do the solution. So first of all, we start out the first step. So we have to identify what we want to maximize. Again. We want to maximize the area, A. Again, we'll say we'll adjust the length, x. Now 
I'll draw a good picture here because we're going to have to put everything. We're going to have to put everything. That's all part of step one. Adjust the length x. We're going to put everything in terms of x in step two. So let me draw a bigger pen here. So let's see. This is x. These are identical. This is x. This is x. And now the total right side here will be our 36 feet of fencing minus the three x's we've used for the horizontal walls. And half of that we use on each side. Or I could write that as 18 minus 3 halves x. And therefore, the total area, A, in terms of x, is just x times that, x times 18 minus 3 halves x, which is equal to 18x minus 3 halves x squared. Okay. Now we're ready. Now we're ready to go into the third step and find the maxima and minima. So once again, of course, the extreme cases are silly. You don't want the thing totally vertical or totally horizontal. It wouldn't have any area to it. And so the max must be a critical case. It must be one of the critical cases, which we get by taking 0 and setting it equal to the derivative. There's our function a. Its derivative is 18 minus 3x, which means, if that's 0, that x is 6. That x is 6. x is 6. That's a little bigger than 36 sevenths. So this is a little bigger than we expected. x is 6. x is 6. x is 6. And the total side length is 18 minus 9, or 9. Which means these are each 4 and a half. And the total area is equal to 6 times 9, or 54 square feet. A little better than the 2 squared. Well, this is kind of intriguing. Why is this? Why isn't it just two squares? Why is it better to have the middle wall longer? Rabbits like that because they can commune across the middle wall. But, but why is it better to have the middle wall longer? Why does that use less strength? So the middle wall is a great bargain because it bounds both pins. And you want to use more of that. You want to use more of that. That's worth more to use that. And that's why it's better to take the middle wall a little longer. I think that's a common principle in these sorts of problems. Make common walls. Make as much use as free or common or shared walls as you can. You'll see that principle come up in other problems you do in the homework, I bet. Okay. So. But our method, now here was a case where our intuition failed, but the method succeeded. So we know from now on we can trust our method even more than we trust our intuition. The problems you look, in the look at in the homework will all follow this same method, although once again they can get more complicated at various points in the steps. It may be harder to put everything in terms of the variable x, and then the algebra and the calculus may get more complicated. But it will always be these same principles. Now I want to depart from our calculus course to show you a problem which really involves other principles. Although it looks like the problem we were just talking about. Find the biggest pen, not necessarily, not necessarily a rectangle anymore, you can make with 36 feet of fence. Now you say, oh, you've got a guess. OK, but before you give your guess, Ryan, I just want to say here why this is a much bigger, more difficult problem. Because now we're allowing all possible shapes of pens, not just rectangles, which are identified by their length and width, but any shape. And that departs from our calculus course, which is called single variable calculus, to a problem in what's really infinite dimensional calculus, or the so-called calculus of variation. 
So it's really a level way above our methods. But this happens to be a problem where maybe somebody can guess the answer, and Ryan's going to try. I bet it's a circle. A circle. Well, yeah, you're right. The circle is the best. Circle is the best. There it is. I've drawn a circle with perimeter 36 feet. Therefore, the radius I get by dividing by 2 pi is about 5.73 feet. And the area of pi r squared is about 103 square feet. So you can see it's better than the square. And in fact, it's the best you can possibly do. It's the best you can possibly do. Well, now let me ask you a bigger question. What shape in space most efficiently encloses volume? So now we want to enclose as much volume as possible with this little surface area. Do you think it might be a, a cube or a cube octahedron? Or maybe you can guess. Yeah, Ryan. A sphere? A round sphere. A round sphere is known to be the right answer, as was discovered eons before humanity inhabited this planet by the soap bubble. In its attempt to, make, to obtain an efficient shape, it solves this infinite dimensional calculus problem and decides to be round. You see these little bubbles actually find that, solve that difficult calculus problem very fast. You see that? Harder problem. What shape in space most efficiently encloses two volumes? Well, here again, you can turn to the bubble for some help. And a good guess here is the double soap bubble. I don't know if you saw one of those here. Two bubbles stick together. You get a more complicated bubble. Like this one, with a little bubble and a big bubble and a surface separating them. So there's a double bubble, and that may be the most efficient way to wall in two volumes in space. At least that's what the soap bubble says. Is the soap bubble right? I think so. But I don't know. And the truth of the matter is that no one knows for sure. And this embarrassing ignorance in mathematics, so typical of the modern state of mathematics, was itself only recently discovered, as a matter of fact. I talked to a number of mathematicians that said, oh, yes, I know that for a fact. But there turned out to be flaws, gaps in their arguments. And in fact, it was just over the course of an undergraduate honors thesis by Joel Foise that this so-called folk theorem, which a lot of people thought they knew, has been reclassified as just a guess or a conjecture that the stubble soap bubble is the most efficient shape. No one knows for sure. And you might say, what else could it possibly be? It's got to be the double soap bubble. And that's what I always thought, and that's what most people believe. But recently, I saw a computer simulation of a different kind of double bubble produced by John Sullivan of the Minnesota Supercomputer Project, now called the Geometry Center. And I brought that along. I'm going to show it to you now. Because when I saw it, I mean, it was I, when I had to admit, gee, I wouldn't have thought of that. And here's the picture. This is just the computer simulation of a different kind of double bubble in which there's one wiener bubble in the center surrounded with another bubble around its waist. Completely different way to pack two bubbles together. Now, a computation actually shows that this isn't quite as good, that it has a little more area than the double soap bubble that we're, we see and we're so familiar with. And so the conjecture is still healthy. People still think the old conjecture is true. 
But what seeing this tells me is that there might well be some other better solution that we just haven't thought of yet. There might be some better way to enclose two volumes that we humans and the soap bubbles just haven't found yet, but which anyone, maybe even a child, might discover in the next year or the next decade. This is a problem that mathematicians are still working on. Now, fortunately, the analogous fact about fencing in regions in the plane is known these regions that look like double bubbles here in the plane are known to be the best way to fence in two areas in the plane. So that much is known. And that fact, though, has only been known for how long would you think? Since the Greeks? Newton? Galileo? No. It's only been known for two years. It's only been known for two years. And two years ago, it was proved by a group of college students that were part of a, an undergraduate research project. Name of Manuel Alfaro, Jeff Brock, Joel Foise, Nick Hodges, and Jason Zimba. And they proved this theorem. And it's, they've written it up. And it's going to appear soon in the Pacific Journal of Mathematics, where it will be published. And this was part of a, pro, of a that theoretical work was another side of some experimental work they did on the best way to enclose areas in the plane with fencing by blowing bubbles between plexiglass plates. There's the best way to enclose three regions, the best way to enclose four regions. Oh, and no, wait, don't give it away yet. What do you guys think is the best way to enclose five regions? You think it'll look like this? Or do you think it'll look like this one on your right? All right, so I'm going to let you take a vote here. How many people think it will be this one on your left? Well, there are several people on yeah, so the one on the left, the people on, the, on my left like the one on the left. And how many people like this one on the right? People on my right like the one on the right. That's nice. Well, you latter voters, I think, have uh, realized the certain mathematical principle that symmetric things tend to be the best. But let's see what we get here with five. Oh, one of them broke. Looks like Jeanette just got the one on the left. And actually, if you do a measurement and normalize these things to account for the differences in areas, the length on the left is 696. The length on the right is 805, not as good. It took more fencing. So that's kind of surprising. This asymmetric one on the left is actually better. Asymmetric one on the left is actually better. Making mistakes like that is one of the best things you can do in mathematics. Make a guess, find out why you're wrong, and then develop a better intuition as a result. You hear about people who have good intuition? They're not born with good intuition. They get good intuition by making mistakes and educating their intuition. Mathematics is the teacher. Our intuition is the student. What's the point of bothering with calculus at all? Why do we want to know the calculus? Why do we want to know to do maximum minima problems? Why don't we just try a bunch of solutions and take one that's pretty good? on the computers. Why is it? A lot? Yeah, Ryan? <laughs> That's true. That's right. A lot of times, calculus is really faster than setting a problem up on a computer and solving it. You can just sometimes write down an equation, take a derivative, find the exact answer. It's often easier to find the exact answer than to find an approximate answer. Now, and sometimes you may want a very accurate answer. Answer. You know, for our rabbits here, 52.9 square feet against 54, it doesn't matter all that much. But if you're sending a rocket, man, to the moon, the difference between 54 degree angle and a 52.9 degree angle could be the, dis the difference between one giant leap for mankind and a spaceship disappearing in the distance through the rings of Saturn. Lost never to return. 
So there are some times where it's important to be very accurate. Computers running longer can get accurate. Calculus can be exactly correct right from the beginning. Mathematicians know very little about mathematics. It's true, and it certainly isn't the fault of mathematicians. They, they uh, try hard to understand things. But the universe, and in particular mathematics, is huger than most people can imagine. Even the things in our universe that look simple upon further analysis are really quite deep. Now, I'm talking today about the shape of a double soap bubble, for example. First look at it, you think that's a simple child's toy. And of course, you expect pieces of spheres to come together. But if you really try to analyze that mathematically and think about what all the different possibilities might be and try to rule out other possibilities that might occur, all of a sudden you realize that the possibilities are almost infinite and that to develop a mathematics that includes all these possibilities is a very daunting very, very daunting task that mathematicians have been chipping away at with determination in their, in their persistent way for centuries, and doubtless will keep working at for centuries more. But I think to succeed in mathematics, maybe as in life too, uh, one has to have the humble realization that one is not going to answer all the questions in a day, that the universe really is big and takes a long time to understand even just the corner of it.